Hey guys, so uh, I'm back and this is another part in my landscape tutorial series. Last time we left the terrain looking a little bit like this and in today's session, we're gonna be looking at how do we turn that into something that looks a little bit more like this. You might be thinking that the static meshes in the scene have something to do with it, you can turn those on, but actually uh, those aren't really the biggest factor. You might also be looking at it and going, well, the lighting looks a little bit different, the clouds and the sky are slightly different, and maybe the layers themselves have been tweaked. And all of those elements are contributing to the difference in the scene that you see before you, but actually those aren't the biggest factors that are kind of like giving it that much richer, interesting visual appeal. The factors that are kind of giving it that appeal are the variation in the terrain material itself. That's a very big contributing factor and the way that the layers and colors seem to blend into each other. So this is all the result of the kind of changes that you might make after you've had some kind of feedback with an art director in a studio or maybe your art lead or just, you know, one of your peers or colleagues. And you basically had a look at the terrain and kind of had to think about, okay, well, what's working, what's not working? And uh, how, how, how do we go and kind of uh, like bring this up and make it look richer, more like the reference uh, and, and just more realistic. So one of the first things we're gonna do is obviously we're gonna take a look again at the reference and we're gonna kind of look at where we went wrong or what can really be, be, be improved. And we're gonna see there's a lot more of those like red colors uh, and that the actual color of the grass varies a lot more uh, from the valley bottom up to the sides of the hills, uh, getting a more of a yellow tint on the top. And uh, you also have these kind of like dark green patches that like are bushes blending into the uh, the heather and the ferns and all of that. And if we jump back over to the Unreal scene, you'll see that we kind of just have like very basic, the layers uh, sort of splattered down on the terrain. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but we're gonna look at what we can do now to kind of like direct that scene uh, and bring it up to the uh, closer kind of to reality, more more appealing uh, and, and just richer and generally more varied appearance that we have here. So uh, I mentioned previously, this is the kind of changes you might have if you were to discuss with an art director. And uh, the kind of changes you're gonna make here will require you to think a little bit like an art director too, if you know, an art director of your own work, which means stepping back from all of the details even further and just looking at it really in the most broad possible sense. So that is, what does the terrain look like as a whole? Uh, and thinking about those really fundamental uh, thing, like sort of artistic principles like color and composition and form. So, as it's an open world environment, we're not really worried too much about the overall 2D composition. And we're obviously using a real world landscape. So we're not gonna be changing any of the uh, the actual structure. We're, we're talking more about in terms of how the layers look and bleed into each other uh, and thinking about the, the kind of the forms within within those blends and the, and the colors specifically. If we're gonna start thinking about the scene as, as an art director, like if we're considering uh, the environment from an art director's perspective, we're gonna want the tools that are gonna allow us to kind of like make those changes to the sort of terrain as a whole globally uh, and not really worrying too much about like the nitty gritty of what each individual layer is doing. So there's quite a few ways of doing this. Um, you know, you can come up with uh, methods that allow you to sort of alter the overall appearance of the landscape uh, quite easily. So one, one of those, uh, one example of how you might do that is you might have uh, like a real world kind of satellite terrain area like I've got here. And you might just actually just kind of take a nice high resolution screenshot, get some uh, open source data and turn that into a texture and then kind of map that onto the uh, terrain uh, like, like it's a texture uh, just being splattered on from above. So we not only have our detailed textures and our uh, and our kind of macro textures, we also have like one global texture. And this is an approach that's quite commonly used. It was used in World of Tanks. And I believe this is also used in uh, the more recent Battlefield and Star Wars games. So they will be using uh, some kind of aerial photographs as the color information for their terrain. Now this is great. Uh, it's a really effective approach if you're going for like just 100% realism uh, and you want it to like really look like the, the specific place at a specific time. Um, so if we jump back into Google Maps again, you can see that you might, with a little bit of processing, be able to use some kind of information like this, get rid of the sort of shadows on the cliffs and use that as, a, as an albedo or base color to blend with your textures from afar. Now, the problem with this approach is that this kind of satellite data obviously just represents the, uh, the, the area, the landscape at one point in time. And that was the point in time in which this bit of data was collected. So if we have a look back over at PureRef, uh, and kind of jump around a little bit within here at the references, you're gonna see that actually uh, the environment just changes a huge amount throughout the seasons. Uh, and if we go all the way from like uh, sort of back to February, early winter, look at the colors here, and then we jump right into the middle of summer, uh, 
uh, we're looking at almost two entirely different environments in terms of the color palettes and uh, even the like distribution of different kinds of vegetation. And it also changes year on year. So I think that the global texture option is, is, a, is, a, is a good option if you want to use satellite data. Um, however, it's kind of a static workflow. Um, you could also author your own approach, like author your own global textures. So if I just hop back into Houdini, um, lots of terrain softwares allow you to do the kind of coloring of the terrain like you see here. So I could absolutely uh, export the color map for this terrain that I've created in Houdini and use that inside of Unreal. And that would give me a little bit more control than the satellite data. And you can do the same inside of, uh, inside of Substance Designer, uh, inside of Quixel Mixer, inside of World Machine, World Creator, uh, Gaia. All of these programs have great resources for texturing your terrain inside of that software. So this is a really vi vi viable option uh, if you want to have a little bit more control than you would if you were just uh, going to use this, the raw satellite data. Uh, and, and you can get some great results this way. Now, I'm going to argue that this, it, while a great approach and one that's used a lot, is a slightly static and inflexible workflow. And it doesn't really uh, empower um, like those kinds of creative sessions where you sort of just sit down with the environment in the engine and you're able to sort of like just tweak things, modify big sweeping changes on the fly. Maybe you're sitting with your art director or your art lead or just a, a colleague and and together you're kind of like putting your, you're putting your brains together and just pushing it that extra mile. When you do it like this, you know, you have to go back out into that external software, make the changes to the texture, export it. Chances are it might be quite a large texture that you then have to export, re-import to Unreal. And uh, it's not like, it's not, it, it, it's not as static as using a real satellite data, but, but at the same time, it does introduce a latency between decision result on the screen. Um, and so what we really want to do is we want to cut that down to like the minimal possible time uh, that you can. So something else that's a very common uh, technique is uh, inside of uh, your engine, inside of Unreal, uh, you might get a hold of like a, a sort of a 2D tiling, uh, like noise map, sort of black and white texture. And you might apply that to uh, sort of like a, a, an additional layer in your landscape that sort of tints the, the terrain underneath it. So if you have a look at this portion of grass here, you can kind of start to see that there are some patterns that look quite noisy. Uh, and maybe like they, they, you wouldn't really notice too much repetition if you did just have a big tiling map on the terrain. So you would basically have like your green grass texture, which was very homogenous, and you have black and white clouds that would be blending between slightly more yellow tint and slightly more green tint. And this is, this is a great approach again. It's really powerful for introducing some great looking variation. But it doesn't really cover, uh, it doesn't really give us a powerful enough tool to do the same kind of grading that we would, for example, if we were doing full coloring inside of, inside of a, an external terrain program or, a, or painting it. You, you know, you can see here that you have the power to, to create much more interesting kind of blends uh, and variation between layers than, than you would just by, uh, just by putting kind of like a, a tiling noise on. Although, uh, although you can get, you know, very nice variation by doing things this way too. So then you might be thinking, okay, well, why not just combine both of these approaches? You have the noise maps to add a little bit more kind of procedural art directable variation and coloring inside of Unreal, in addition to maybe just tinting the layers. But you also then have that kind of like color map that's come either from satellite data or from like an external program where you author it. But this sort of adds like two additional steps and a bit more complexity. It's a little bit more involved. Uh, and also those all those textures, they're just additional texture samples. Um, so, so I'm going to propose uh, an alternative route that you can go down, which, uh, which I'm going to coin the term right now. Uh, I wrote it down a second ago. Let's have a little look. Content-aware color grading for terrains. Um, so this is an approach that really takes advantage of the kind of interactive uh, aspect of like uh, sort of working with materials inside of Unreal. And we basically uh, have like come up with a way to uh, just do sort of really interesting color grading of the terrain direct inside of Unreal, which really emulates all of those powerful features that you have inside of external uh, terrain editing softwares. Because inside of Unreal, we have access to all of the layer weight information, but we also have access to, th to things like the, amount, the, the slope angle, we have access uh, to elevation, uh, and we can use all of this information to, uh, to sort of do some cool uh, and interesting uh, sort of tweaking of color that is very aware of the sorts of features that actually make up the terrain. And you can see I'm not actually using any tiling 2D noise maps here, but we still get that really rich textured pattern variation between different colors on the terrain. And this is given to us for free uh, from the terrain height map because 
it's so interesting, detailed, and varied. Oh, that's not really the best example of it right there. Um, but just generally speaking, uh, you can see that because it's come from LIDAR, we just have all of these tiny details which actually come from real world terrain information. And the more we can pick those out, the more we can find ways to to sort of highlight and accentuate those LIDAR terrain details, the richer and more realistic and detailed our terrain is going to feel. Um, so that's what we're going to get onto now. We're going to have a look at how do we set up a material function which is going to be using gradients to color grade the terrain according to its own surface properties like slope, angle, and elevation. All right, uh, so with no further ado, let's begin by creating a new material layer. Uh, so the material layer is the layer that's going to be responsible for the uh, color grading that's going to be taking place where we'll set the colors. So let's call this ML underscore colorize. And we're also going to want a new blend asset. So I'm going to go into material blends and I'm going to create a new material layer blend. And I'm going to call this one MLB per layer tint. All right. So if we go back into the material layers folder and open up the new ML colorize, material layer colorize. What we're going to do is set up a few controls that allow us to set the color. So what we basically want is we want to have the ability to map a curve to the height and or the slope, and then to potentially additionally modulate it with a texture. So I'm just going to kind of lay out the structure of this material before we get underway. So I'm going to make a comment box and I'm going to call this curve asset. So we're going to be using a type of asset in Unreal, which is a curve, uh, which can hold a gradient of colors. And that's going to be sampled here. We're also going to be making the logic to kind of sample by height. So we're going to call this height sampling. So this is the height of the terrain at any given location. And then we're also going to do some slope sampling. And finally, I lied earlier when I said there was no noise. We are going to introduce a little bit of texture modulation too, just to break up those edges. So now that we've got the kind of basic kind of ingredients we know we need to create, let's have a look at this curve asset as it's kind of the most important part. We're going to have to create the curve asset. So I'm going to go back to the content browser and I'm going to create a new folder, bullet curves. I'm going to make an asset inside of miscellaneous. I'm going to make an asset called a curve atlas, CA terrain colors. That's curve atlas terrain colors. Now the curve atlas is a table. So what does that mean? Well, it basically means it's a texture uh, which can contain any number of curves, almost unlimited curves. So we can set the width of the curve atlas up here with the texture width. And that means that, <clears throat> and that means that we can have up to 256 curves, plenty. Uh, you can increase or decrease this value, but I'm gonna leave it on the default for now. This is not where we define the curves, it just stores them. We also need to create individual curves. So I'm gonna go back to miscellaneous, I lost it there, and go to curve, and I'm going to select curve linear color. And I'm just going to call that underscore C, C underscore grass variation, or let's go with grass ramp. And you can see by default, we get a black to white gradient. I'm going to go into the curve atlas terrain color again. There it is. And you're going to see that we have the option to add gradient curves. I'm going to, there's an array here. So I'm going to add one. And the one that I'm going to add is the C grass ramp that I just created there. And we should see, if we have a little zoom in, that the very top of this curve atlas table, it's very hard to see, but it's now black to white. And that's now going to update 
to reflect whatever colors are stored, stored in the curve itself. Now, if we go back to the ML colorize function, I'm going to search for curve atlas row parameter. And I'm going to call this curve. Ah. When we select the curve asset, the curve parameter, you'll see that there are two inputs that it expects. First of all, we need to hook up the atlas. So I'm going to choose the curve atlas terrain colors that we just created. And then once you've hooked that up, if we click on the curve itself, you'll see it will list all of the curves that are a part of that curve atlas. So I'm going to choose the grass ramp and apply and save. What we have now is a reference like a basically a texture lookup that's going to find the ramp. If I right click the curve and hit start previewing, and switch to planar view there, we're gonna see that it's entirely black. Now, why is that? That's because we haven't provided an input to the curve time. So to begin with, just to preview it inside of the material, I'm gonna create a texture coordinate and you'll see that this just expects a scalar input. So what I'm gonna do texture coordinates are uh, two scalars by default, is I'm just going to do component mask. And we're just going to get the red channel. That is the U channel of the UVs. And now you can see that we have the gradient from the curve being shown in the viewport here because UV starts at zero and ends at one. So we can see that when the UV is at zero, it's sampling the, the leftmost portion of the curve and when the UV is at one, it's gonna sample the rightmost end of the curve. All right, so I'm gonna leave this window open and I'm gonna go back into the curve app asset that we have. Here it is. And I'm just gonna bring this up a little bit. So I've opened up that curve asset, the editing window for it. And you're gonna see that we have this gradient here along the top. And if I select the kind of white top right most pin there and change the color of that, you're gonna see that updates in the material live. So for the time being, I'm just gonna very roughly define what I think the color should be. I'm gonna have a sort of yellowy side at, right at the far right, which, and I'm gonna have, oh, I just double click back. And then for the black, I'm not gonna have black. I'm gonna have a kind of, kind of green that I feel is kind of like nice and grassy and appropriate. And I'm gonna kind of imagine that this curve is gonna be applied to the landscape from the bottom of the valley, bottom of the valley being the left green to the top of the hills being that kind of yellow color. And actually I'm gonna add in an intermediate stage that's also green uh, and slightly more towards yellow. So we get that kind of gradation there. Maybe I'll bring down the brightness of that yellow slightly so that it all fades together a little bit more naturally. Okay, so we've got our grass color curve and we need to supply something slightly more meaningful to the curve uh, so that it actually knows information about the landscape and the thing that I want to supply to it first of all is the height of the landscape. The way that I can do this is I can create a world position node so this is going to get the world position of the pixel currently being rendered and I'm going to create a component mask there. This allows me to isolate one of the three channels of the vector which represents the position. And because I'm only interested in the height, I'm not interested in R and G, which correspond to X and Y, but B, which corresponds to Z or the up axis. This is now gonna return the point in the vertical axis of a pixel, the location in the vertical axis, the height, you could say. But that height is going to be ranging from, I don't know, whatever the bottom of the train is up to the very top. So that could be thousands and thousands, that could be literally thousands of meters or thousands of units or tens of thousands of unreal units. And I need to normalize that into the zero to one range because that's what the curve is expecting. Now, fortunately, there's a really easy way to do this, which is we can just use a handy function called remap value range. We'll make the height of the terrain the input, I'm gonna make some more space here. And I'm gonna expand this comment box. Ooh, there we go. So now we just need to supply the input low and high. 
So the input low and high is going to represent the uh, the kind of bounds of the terrain. So input low needs to be the very, very bottom of the terrain and input max needs to be the very, very top of the terrain. So I'm going to call this in height min. And I'm going to call, make another scalar holding S and left clicking. And I'm going to call this in height max. Now, I've obviously messed up my capitalization there, so I will tidy that up, even though it's a bizarre capitalization I'm doing. And I don't know what the values are for this, so I'm just going to leave them on zero, zeroed out for the time being. This is going to be something that gets set inside of the material instance. Now, I'm also going to set up the remapped min and remapped max. And quite simply, these should just be left on zero and one. Now you don't have to make these parameters, but leaving them as parameters does allow you to kind of uh, tweak a slightly maybe more um, intuitive way once you're in the material instance, if you want to offset uh, the height, top or bottom of your landscape at all. And now if I plug that in, in place of the texture coordinate over there, and then just make sure that I go and set the base color here. So we're going to pass the output of the curve into the base color. That is now going to be taking the kind of make creating a black and white gradient, black to white gradient from the bottom to the top of the terrain, zero to one. And then the curve is going to be uh, coloring the terrain according to what's in the atlas uh, there. Okay. So that's it for now inside of the uh, inside of the material layer. I'm going to go ahead and apply and save and close that. And we're going to go back to our material blends. We're going to open up that MLB per layer tint. There it is. I'm also going to open up an MLB rock layer or any of the other layers. It doesn't matter which one. And quickly go inside of there so I can just grab the get landscape layers function that we made previously. And then I'm going to go back into the per layer tint blend. I'm going to use the get landscape layers. Remember that has to be plugged into the top layer. And I'm not going to get any individual layer because I want this tint to be applicable to all or any of the layers. I don't want to make an individual tint for every single layer that I might add. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to create a multiply. I'm going to create a scalar parameter. I'm going to plug that into the B input. And then I'm going to also create a max node. So why have I done all of that? Well, the reason is I can now copy that one, two, three, four, five times. So copy it four times. There we go. And then I can plug the rock into the first multiply, sediment into the second multiply, gravel and so on. And then what I can do as well, is actually I don't need this. I'm going to delete the very bottom max there. I can actually then wire in all of these maxes here. I did that slightly wrong. So what I'm trying to do is basically just add the results of all of those layers. And what this does is it lets us control the weight of the tint for every single layer. And then it will add all of those results together. And finally, rather than blending all the material attributes, we just want to do a matte blend tint. We want to get the matte layer blend tint. I'm going to hold control and left click to reroute the A input and the B input down there. That's not quite right, actually. What I need to do, I need to do something else here. So I'm just going to delete that blend material attributes. And I've rerouted the bottom layer in there. And I'm going to plug the output into the output material attributes. We're going to take the max of that kind of blending that we're doing down there into the tint mask. And then for the tint itself, what we do is we get material attributes. And we're going to get the base color. And that's going to be plugged into the tint. So now the material layer, which is only setting the base color because we're only using it for tinting, we're getting the material attributes and passing that into the tint function here. And the last thing we need to do before we forget is go down and just name all of these parameters. So once all of those have been hooked up and renamed, we can go ahead and apply and save and leave it open this time. And We've also got our ML colorize, so I'll, I'll open that up too. There we go. So I'm just going to group those there for the time being. 
We'll come back and modify it more in a second. And it's time to go into the material instance. And what we're going to do inside of the material instance is add in those new layers that we've created. And this is one of the kind of peculiarities of, of modifying materials in Unreal with landscapes is that it takes a really long time to compile the more complex your landscape, landscape material becomes. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, kind of speed up the video here. All right. So now that that has been hooked up, we can have a quick look. We've got our new layer six there, which we can call the grass tinting. And you can see we've got the MLB layer tint plugged in and the ML colorize up there. So let's just bring this over to the side so we can look at our terrain. And I'm going to drag that down there. By default, all of the parameters are set to zero. So the tinting is not having any effect for the time being. If I go inside of the scalar parameter and enable grass weight, I'm just going to put that on one so we can see what we're working with. And by default, you might end up with something like this. 10 points if you can remember what might be causing this. And yet you've got it. It's because we didn't set the in height max or the in height min for the terrain. So how are we going to do that? Well, quite simply, because I'm lazy, I'm just going to start throwing in numbers. 10,000. Okay, so you can see that's now blended a bit there. There's now a region to blend. What about 20,000? You can see that's pulling it up further. So that's, that's kind of nice. I'm getting the top of the curve at the bottom there. But we can see that zero is quite clearly not the bottom of the landscape. So I'm actually just going to go ahead and try to minus the value I've put in there. Maybe, maybe double it times two. Maybe even again times two. And I'm kind of happy with that. So you don't need to be super precise. You can find out what the exact top and exact bottom of your landscape are. But I think for the time being, this is going to do just fine. Let's go with that. And the remapped max and min is already fine. So we now, if we go now back to the curve asset, so I can actually just double click it there. It's going to open it up. And we now have the ability to kind of direct the look of the grass just by putting in a new point there and by changing the color. So if I make that bright red, we can see that, okay, the green at the bottom of the curve isn't quite being hit. So if I go back to my material instance, I'm just going to make that a little bit lower. And we see now, okay, so now we're getting that green back in at the bottom. So we've already added the ability to tweak the, uh, to tweak the color of the terrain in a really meaningful way, uh, but it's still quite basic. It's still just uh, it's still just working based off of the height, uh, and actually um, there's something else we're going to want to do to the color uh, in order to get it to blend in a slightly more intuitive way. And you, I'll kind of point out the issue with the way it's currently blending in a second. So this is already nice, but it's a little bit too kind of like I suppose monotonous. So let's just kind of play this play around with this a little bit. And what you might notice once you've started playing around with this a bit yourself is that it's only possible to darken the underlying terrain. So that means that as long as your values are between zero and one, if you plug in a just pure white value here, it's not actually going to make the terrain look more white here or brighter. It's just going to preserve the original color as if there was no curve being applied at all. And that's problematic as you start wanting to get in kind of subtle variations towards the top of the terrain. So how do we go about solving that? Well. One answer is that we can just increase the, uh, the brightness to a value higher than one. But I find that to be a little bit unintuitive because the sliders all stopped working in that case. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to go back to the colorize function. And we're just going to add in a scalar parameter called tint strength. And we're going to set the default to be one, which is going to multiply by the curve. This is just a global strength control. And then we're also going to add to that half of the tenth strength, but inverted. And what that's going to allow us to do is you'll see that by default, the, the tintings become much more subtle. What that's going to allow us to do is more intuitively match the color of the ramp itself. So I'm just going to put that 
tint strength up to you can put it anywhere between well, anywhere you want really i'm going to put it on two and that's going to allow you to yeah much more intuitively tint the terrain um, with the with the curves not very scientific just something that i found works well now i love the fact that i now have the ability to kind of tint the terrain uh very very you know sort of in in runtime uh have a lot of a lot of control but what I'm missing at the moment is I feel a bit of variation, a bit more visual interest. It's too, it's too, it's still too uniform, still too homogenous. What I'm going to do about that is I'm going to go into the colorize function again, and we're going to add in the ability to bias this zero to one range here with the slope. So we're going to put down a node called slope mask. And then we're going to just have a quick preview of that. You can see by default, it's grabbing not the slopes. So I'm gonna invert it, start previewing that. You can see now we're getting the slopes. And I'm gonna do a constant bias scale, which is going to remap that, because currently it's between zero and one. So I want to remap that into the minus one and uh, positive one range. So you can imagine, uh, where the constant bias scale works is if you have a value of zero, uh, we're going to subtract 0.5 from it and then multiply that by two. So that becomes minus one. And similarly, one, if you subtract 0.5 from it, becomes 0.5. And if you times that by two, it becomes one. And everything in between gets remapped between minus one and one from zero to one. So really useful node there. And then I'm going to multiply that by a parameter called slope weight. It's going to be the overall influence of the slope masking on the color grading. And then we're also going to plug in the slope fall off power and the slope contrast, just as if we were making a terrain auto material. I'm gonna set the default value to be 0.7 on the contrast and the default value fall off to be 0.5. Okay, so now, we need to kind of bring that into the uh, into the curve asset. And the way we're going to do that is we're just going to add it to the height. So they're kind of equal class citizens in a sense. Um, they both have an equal weighting. And now you have the ability to control whether the curve color variation is more influenced by slope or more by height. And in our case, we want it to mainly be affected by the height. And then the slope is just going to bias it bias it slightly. So what that means is the steeper the slope, the more yellow it's going to become. So the more we're going to err towards the right side of the curve. So we go ahead and hit apply. Then once it's finished compiling, we're going to jump into the material instance. And still inside of our grass tinting layer, we're going to go to the slope controls. And I'm going to go slope weight one. And by default, that's going to have the, uh, it's not really going to give you the result you're after. It's because the, the slope weight is too strong. So let's try a smaller value, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. 0 0.2, let's try and increase the contrast and the slope fall off power, 15. There we go. And when the slope fall off power is increased, like so, maybe turn the slope contrast down again, maybe even higher, so the slope fall off power. And now if we start changing the slope weight, so zero, that's just all of the height. And then the more we bring in, let's go and find a nice shallow slopey area over here. Now, the more we bring in the slope weight, the more it's going to add some meaningful color variation to that grass layer, as you can see. So that's on full, uh, bring down the slope fall of power. It's completely off and let's just bring it up bit by bit. And you're gonna see now how that starts to really interestingly kind of carve out some, some details from the uh, from the grass, from the terrain there. Especially on the slope over here, it's particularly apparent. Slope full of power, one, two, three. And it gives us a really nice kind of more textured blend between the colors. So it's not just being influenced by the height anymore. But that's not everything. Um, you can see that we've got these, we've still got these big flat patches uh, of, of just normal terrain kind of on the ground here. Um, like just completely flat where, where there would be a lake. So normally this would be covered in water, um, but just, uh, just for the sake of uh, kind of completeness, 
we're going to go back into the ML colorize and we are going to give ourselves the ability to kind of distort this further with a texture. So I'm going to get a texture sample parameter. I'm going to call this the mod modulation texture. I'm going to search for just a default noise that comes with Unreal. So let's go for mm, low res blurred noise. And then I'm going to make sure that it's being mapped in world space because I want it to be mapped in world space. So I'm going to reuse the absolute world position I had before. Make sure I'm just getting the RNG, that is the X and Y coordinates. I'm going to multiply that by a value of 1E <laughs> minus to the 0.6. I can't remember how you describe that mathematical notation, but a very small value. So I think it's got 0 0.0000001 because I've just found that to work for landscapes. And then I'm going to multiply that with a modulation scale parameter, which I'm going to set to 10 by default. Plug that into the UVs. Now, by default, this is going to be between 0 and 1, but I actually want it between, be, to be between, again, minus 1 and 1. And the reason for that is because when it goes between minus 1 and 1, it actually allows it to, to subtract here. It doesn't just add to the kind of the grayscale value. I'm going to multiply that. I'm going to call that modulation strength. And I'm just going to make sure that all of these parameters here for the modulation are going to go into a group called modulation, as well as the texture itself. I'm going to make sure that the slope parameters go into a group called slope, as well as the height parameters. I'm then going to make sure that I saturate the result of the first edition. That means it's going to clamp it between 0 and 1. You see if we mouse over it, it says uh, clamp the value between 0 and 1. And the reason we're using saturate instead of clamp is because, as it says in the tooltip, saturate is a free operation. And then we're going to do the same. I'm going to add, after the saturate, the modulation. And we're going to saturate again. Plug that into the curve time. And hit apply and save. If you get an error, as I just did, we need to make sure that the value being fed into the curve asset, curve atlas row parameter, the value being fed in here must be grayscale. So I need to plug in the red channel of the modulation texture, not the RGB. Okay, so now if we go back into the material instance, we'll see that all of our parameters have now been nicely grouped inside of the tinting layer. And if I go into the modulation here and increase the modulation strength slightly, you're going to see we start to see that noise being added in, uh, added into the variation. So I might just increase the modulation scale slightly, and then I might go and change that noise to something slightly kind of rougher around the edges. Let's try a noise mask. I reduce the strength of the modulation. There you go. That's feeling a bit better. Maybe a bit. Maybe it's a bit too strong still. And you see that's now not actually uh, kind of directly tinting the terrain, but it is uh, breaking up the uh, the slope and the uh, height variation. So it's sort of adding a bit of chaos into that there. So that's part of it. And it's breaking up these big open planes quite a lot more now. It's just nicer. And uh, what I'm going to do now is instead of trying to tweak this curve here, I'm going to go back to the Curve Atlas table. And I'm actually going to just add in the curve that I made earlier. I'm going to add a new curve parameter, a new curve to the Atlas table. And I'm going to select the grass curve that I made previously. I'm going to go back into the material instance. And I can just now select that grass curve. In the drop down, and I might need to tweak another parameter to get that to show up. Lastly, I'm going to just copy over the settings that I found worked nicely for this terrain 
from my previous material. Okay, and uh, upon copying over the settings, um, it obviously looks a little bit odd, not quite the same. And I realized it's because I just missed one key step, which is because the grass weight is currently applied everywhere as the other layers are non-weight blended, I actually need to go into each of those other layers and set the value to minus one. Now, that's looking a lot more like it, but you may not see the same thing happening at your end. And the reason for that is because we need to go back into inside the material layer blend per layer tint. And we need to make sure that we're not actually maxing, as I told you to do earlier, we are adding them together, which is what allows a negative value. If you imagine you add a negative value, it's actually going to subtract from the weight. So this is important. Like so. And then I'm going to saturate the end result to make sure it can never go outside of zero and one. And I'm going to plug that in instead. And just to kind of remind myself that minus one means like, okay, it's really off. I'm actually just going to force everything to be minus one as a default value. And now you'll see that if we revert it to how it was previously, where everything else was on zero, we get that behavior where the colorization is happening everywhere. And now if I subtract it from the gravel, subtract it from the heather, the rock, the sediment, you see now we're not getting that any longer. And suddenly that kind of orange grass on the slopes makes a little bit more sense because it, it's there to help the grass kind of blend into the heather a little bit more. All right. Now, the beauty of this layered material system is, of course, the fact that you can add as many layers as you want. And I did just that. So I've, uh, I've added in uh, a bunch more variation. Um, if I turn off those meshes again, um, you can see that I've added in a tint heath layer, which acts just like the tint grass layer, just has different color curve, different parameters set up. Uh, I've also gone in and I've actually imported two more kind of grass layers. So these aren't tint layers. I've just created a couple more splat maps for grass wetland and grass upland. So I'll leave it up to you to figure out where and how I might have uh, distributed or created those. Um, and lastly, um, I've also created uh, these kinds of woodland layers. Um, so actually, I'll just turn off those dynamic shadows for the time being, because um, that is definitely uh, kind of messing, messing things up. You can see I've added in some uh, woodland uh, biomes too, and some shrubs as well, which will become in handy later on when using uh, when using meshes like when I want to populate the uh, kind of the fields and stuff. So um, there's lots of ways to generate all of these maps. Uh, I've done it all inside of Houdini um, and I'll be going over specifically how I made these kinds of woodland maps uh, in the future because um, they're really based off of the actual distribution of trees from the area. But uh, yeah, that's, that's it for today. Um, I uh, thank you so much for your time. And uh, I hope that you are happy with how your landscape is turning out. Uh, I think this kind of set of tools that uh, we've set up today for color grading the train is really powerful. And I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, how you guys get on. Um, so I'm going to be having a slightly different kind of video soon where uh, I hop on with uh, one of the community members. Um, so I've already brought that up previously. We're going to be having a kind of like um, just a chat really um, about the landscape that he's working on. Uh, we're going to kind of talk about maybe some areas for improvement, what he was, uh, what his goals are with the environment, uh, and really just, you know, kind of celebrating uh, the work of another artist who's creating landscapes because it's really cool. So, um, yeah. All right. I'll just hop back over one last time to the environment. Um, this is where we're at at the moment. And uh, yeah, uh, we're pretty, pretty close to being able to, uh, to call this done. We just need to set up the detail texturing because right now it's all just macro uh, and global color. Uh, and we also need to go through how I've set up the uh, the texturing for the, like the the background there. You can see that we've got that nice seamless blend going on in this scene. So that'll be that'll be coming up shortly too. Um, all right. Until next time. Uh, if you really like what you're seeing, you want to see more, please like and subscribe. It gives me loads of motivation to make more of this stuff and to make the quality better. Uh, and uh, see you next time. <laughs>